Hi everybody and welcome once again to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James Swagger and in just a moment I'm going to be talking to David Rowe, an English Egyptologist and he's the former director of the Institute for the Study of Interdisciplinary Sciences. And he has from the 1980s uh, onwards put forward some several unconventional theories that are revising the chronology of ancient Egypt and Israel to form an alternative uh, new chronology. Um, I'm going to be reviewing his book, A Test of Time, The Bible from Myth to History. Um, and what a fascinating book it is. We've got ancient Egypt, we've got uh, Palestine and Israel and all sorts of biblical archaeology involved. And wow, it's, it's, it's a very analytical book. Um, the accepted dating is plagued with errors. Um, and I think David has really, really shown what's right and what's wrong and why it is wrong and why it is right. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on our guest for today. Hi, David. Welcome to Capricorn Radio. Hi, James. Nice to be here. Wow. That's an awesome book you've wrote. I, before we get into any of the book, I just want to talk about recent events in Egypt. We have, sure. we, we have yeah. snow and we have one of the biggest titans in, in, uh, in Egypt, Zahi Hiwas, getting a bit excited at the moment. So, um, what, what, uh, interesting times to talk about. It is indeed. Well, the strangest thing about Egypt at the moment is it's snowing in Cairo for the first time in 112 years, which is quite extraordinary. The whole world seems to have gone crazy with its weather at the moment. Yeah. So you've got two feet of snow in Jerusalem and, and snow in Cairo. Now, nobody's ever seen that, David. Really, in, in well, nobody life. who's alive, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. unless you've lived to 112 and you wouldn't remember. You need to be 120 to have any sort of memory of it. Wow. Absolutely right. Yeah, maybe Zahi Was has created the snow. That's possible, <laughs> I suppose. What's going on with Zahi Was? Is, is he? Is well, he? I think he's melting uh, off one more time. Is he? Uncle Zahi. Yeah. Uh, what can we say about him? Really, he's been uh, around in the antiquity service now for about twenty-five years, mm. and uh, he actually he was made the first minister of antiquities um, after the revolution, just before the revolution, in fact, mm. and uh, continued to do so, and was then sacked and replaced by Mohammed Ibrahim. But he's still trying to stir things up, as, as he usually does. Yeah. Um, he's a very famous Egyptologist, obviously, and he, he goes and lectures all around the world, but he has some very, very strange ideas as to what Egyptology really is about. Mm. And uh, he's, he sees himself as the sort of saviour of Egypt's antiquities and the, the man who will bring the tourists back. But quite frankly, a lot of tourists are put off by him. He's, oh, uh, yeah. He's a very extreme individual, and uh, he's caused a lot of trouble of late. And he's also been the keeper of the keys, so to speak. So he's given access uh, to people to work in Egypt. And, and, of course, certain people have to pay monies to get that access. And so he's made himself a very wealthy man over the, over the last few years. And uh, he tends to break all the rules uh, that were established there from uh, many years ago. So I'm rather pleased that he's out at the moment and that uh, somebody else is in charge. However, you never know with Zahi. Yeah. He might end up coming back again. So everybody has to be careful what they say. Yeah. Yeah, you know, exactly. I think, that, well, David, I'm, I'm guessing you would not be uh, a buddy of Zahi with the book that you wrote because uh, I don't think he would have liked any of this. No, well, Zahi doesn't like any new ideas, to Anything be Anything else to this is alternative. Yeah, this is alternative. And I've come across problems with him. You know, I mean, I've I've been uh, surveying the eastern desert of Egypt looking for prehistoric rock art, and mm. uh, Zahi cancelled my permit. Um, so he is a little bit difficult, unless, um, as I say, unless you're his buddy, uh, you tend not to do well in Egypt these days. Wow, that's just like a dictatorship, really, isn't it? Well, it is. As I said, you know, if he's if he's the man in charge of who gets the permits to do what then all you get is people who have to suck up to him to get their, you know, their permits to do their work. And that's not a healthy situation. It's not healthy, no. That's got to be incredibly frustrating. I know, I know everybody that I talk to, they just find him infuriating. This is the non-Egyptologist, like, you know, people that are into Egyptology and, the, and they're watching the Discovery Channels and the National mm -hmm. Geographic and all the programmes. We, we just look at him and go, oh my God, this guy's just well, infuriating. You know what? That's really interesting because there, there are people in Egyptology who keep absolutely quiet about him because they don't want to risk losing their, uh, excavation permits. Mm. And at the other side of the spectrum, you've got Americans who actually love him and you will pay a lot of money to go and see him lecture. And he, he spouts all this nonsense really? in these huge halls of 2,000, 3,000 people. And so you've got to your opposite end of the spectrum and in the middle there, You've got all the people who think the guy's crazy. 
and, uh, you know, don't want anything to do with him. But uh, so you've got the extremes of the academics on one side keeping quiet about him, and at the far extreme of the people who know nothing about ancient Egypt wow. loving him and think he's a great hero. That's, <laughs> I never knew that. I didn't even know he had a following in America. Oh, a massive following, yeah, wow. absolutely. And, and you know that he receives $200,000 a year, or did do, from National Geographic for being yeah. their explorer in residence. I look into now, that. that. You know, that's an extraordinary situation that National Geographic should be doing that. Mm. That's just open to scrutiny and open to abuse. That's what that is. But, um, well, exactly, and it's under investigation now by the U.S. State Department, so we'll see what evolves out of that. But, mm. uh, yes, I mean, the man has made a lot of money over the years, and there are a lot of people who's, who have been damaged on the on the way to his fame and fortune. So we'll see how it develops in the coming years. You know, yeah. He'll still be around, I'm sure, for a few years, <laughs> few years yet. Sure. You know, David, I uh, when, when I watched the Arab Spring happening in a spittle to Egypt, mm -hmm. Um, mm. I, I then watched Egypt fall and, and then, uh, Mubarak and then I was like, you know, Zahi was ousted and I was like, oh my God, Egypt has a chance now, a chance yeah. for the first time in ages for like, you know, the keys to be opened up, as you say, you know, the keeper of the keys ca is no longer there. Maybe somebody might get in and do some proper research. Well, oh. unfortunately, the problem well, that arises out of that is out of the chaos that's been left behind, it's very difficult for a, an honest man to actually sort things out. Uh, Mohammed Ibrahim is the current Minister of Antiquities. I've known him since the 80s. I worked with him in the Serapium in Saqqara, in the Apis Bull Vaults. Uh, and yeah. he was director of Saqqara at the time. Then he actually left the Antiquities Service to go and teach as a professor at the university because he wanted to avoid the clashes with Zahi, who was just up the road in Giza. So he actually retired from the antiquity service early in order to avoid clashes with Zaki and his, and his mob at uh, Giza. And he's only just been invited back now after about 30 years to come and take charge of the antiquity service. And he's having a really difficult time because Zaki has got lots of allies yeah. that have been you know, working with him over the years and lots of people with, you know, difficulties in their cupboards, you know, hiding in their cupboards that can be exposed if anything changes. So you, the, the current minister is really having a tough time of it, trying to get things in order. Wow. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Apis Temple there and the the, the Serapim and that because yeah. that's the start of your book, uh, A Test of Time. Is it? I've forgotten. Uh, yes, that's it has. True, well, it's, I can no, forgive you. Right. It's about 500 pages long. I can forgive you for forgetting any details. But I'm, it's, no, it's, no, no, I haven't really forgotten. Of course I know you haven't it's, because it's it's a well-wrote book. It's well... Uh, I mean... I, I'm I'm reading the book, David, right? And I, mm. I and I'm looking at the chronology that you've gone at this, like you've really gone at this, but you've gone at it in a very analytical manner, and you've gone, look, this is this is what we do know, this is what we don't know, this is speculation. We can work mm. with this. We can. I mean, uh, did you? Are, are you the only one to have seen this, David? Or well, I'm not the only one, but uh, I mean, there's been people who've been questioning the chronology of Egypt for donkey's years, right? Even Isaac Newton. Uh, tried to re redate uh, the kings of Egypt even before we could decipher the hieroglyphs. So there are people been doing this for donkey's years. However, they've not been very successful. And what I set out to do was to break the whole thing down, mm. uh, sort of like take the whole thing to pieces again and start from scratch. Now, it's very easy to criticize and knock something down. It's much more difficult to rebuild it correctly afterwards. And that's always been the challenge here. Uh, so it's finding a way to get the dates of Egypt right, to make them work with the rest of the ancient world. That's always been the critical thing. Because I don't know if you realize it, but mm. the the history of ancient Egypt dictates the chronology and the timeline of other civilizations, yeah. principally because you find that the pharaohs, their inscriptions are found all over the ancient world. Mm. So when you find an inscription of Ramesses II or a scarab or a relief or a statue or a stela, in Palestine or in Israel or, or anywhere else, that dates the layer in which the stela or the object was found wow. to the time of Ramesses. And so whatever dates you give for Ramesses, you give to that biblical site or that ancient site from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so Egypt becomes the key to dating the rest of the ancient world. Wow, yeah. Okay, the good thing about the chronology is, when I, and what I like, I, I'm an engineer, David, so you can appreciate, right. you can, yeah, you can appreciate how I can follow the book, and yeah. you got these anchor points, you got like, sometimes Egypt goes to war, you have archaeoastronomy, you've got like solar yeah. eclipses, you got famines, you got, you know, you got mm -hmm. events that you can tie in as anchor points to, to help the chronology, and that's, that's the beautiful thing for me, because I can see the chronology, working the new chronology, I should say. Absolutely, um, yes. You've got to, you've really got to have some firm hooks 
on which to date things. And in the past, what's happened is, unfortunately, that over the last two or three hundred years, scholars have been going out to this part of the world with a trowel in one hand and the Bible in the other hand and trying to sort of like combine the two, trying to find <laughs> evidence for the Bible in the dirt of archaeology. Wow. And they've used the Bible to date Egyptian history. Wow. And that's been the big mistake. You can't use a text like that to try and date Egyptian history and then use Egyptian history to destroy the Bible and say the Bible wasn't true. So it's it's like a circular argument. And mm. that's what I, I saw in this problem, that they had used a circular argument to date Egyptian history. And then Egyptian history is used to say that the Bible's a myth. Mm. You know, and I, I, I actually hadn't realized when I, until I read a test at time how much uh, biblical archaeology is wrapped up in uh, ancient Egypt. And, you know, it, it's so interwoven on various scales, David. Various well, scales. You, well, if you think about it, they're neighbors. So why shouldn't it be? Why shouldn't they? I mean, Israel is, you know, borders on Egypt. So, of course, there will be a relationship between the two. The amazing thing is why we've not found any connections between the two after 300 years of scholarship. Mm. That is what's astonishing. And so we have we have scholars now all over the world, very, very good scholars and respected scholars, saying, well, there is no connection between the Bible and, and Egypt. Therefore, the Bible, we know Egypt's real. The Bible, therefore, can't be real. That's what they've the conclusion they've come to. Wow. You know, and and they give you this Zionist uh, thing, all this Zionist race card all the time. And, and for me, look, mm. if the evidence is there, the evidence is there, David. I don't care if it's a race, a religion, well, yeah, or a creed. You, you're quite right. Zionism is a funny thing, though, because Zionism really isn't historical, remember. I mean, yeah. the word Zion just is one term or name for the city of David. Yeah. It doesn't really exist as such. As a, it's a modern phenomenon. Mm. It's an idea of, a, of a, 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 a an Israelite or a an Israeli state mm. or, or a Jewish state in, in Palestine is the convention, something that's been invented over the last hundred years. But it, it didn't exist before that. Yeah, but I mean, if you mention any sort of biblical link with uh, Egypt, are you, are you branded a Zionist? Like that's the well, you are. You are in the Arab world, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, so. If you look at the if you look at the history and you find evidence for the Israelites in Egypt, or you find evidence for the conquest of the Promised Land, or whatever the story is, the relationship between Solomon and Pharaoh, all those things. As soon as you bring the Bible into it, you're regarded as a promoter of Zionism, and that's very sad. But that's, again, modern politics. That's got nothing to do with real history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so David, the story starts for you uh, at the Serapeum, yeah? Um, and, you're, yeah. and you're looking for, tell us about this, uh, this is interesting, because this kind of gives you the first um, insight in the book to, you know, something's amiss, something's wrong. Right. Yeah, well, what happened was I, I was in Egypt on one of my trips, and I've been there so many times, and I've forgotten how many times. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was back in the 1980s, if I remember rightly. And I went to to see Mohammed Ibrahim, the current Minister of Antiquities, who was then the director of Saqqara. And I walked into his office, and I said, look, I'm interested in the lesser vaults of the Serapeum, which I know you're currently excavating. Now, the Serapeum is divided into two sections. There's the greater vaults, which everybody goes into today, and you see those giant sarcophagi. Uh, of the late period, that's from about the 26th dynasty through to the Ptolemaic period. But there was an earlier set of vaults adjacent to those, which go much earlier, that go to the 19th dynasty. Mm -hmm. So you've got the 19th dynasty and 20th dynasty, that's the time of Ramesses II. Now these vaults are supposed to continue right the way up until the point where the greater vaults have started. So you have a continuous sequence of burials from the time of Ramesses II all the way through to the first king of the 26th dynasty, or you should have in those lesser vaults, and then the, then the greater vaults start. But when uh, we went to investigate this, and I went into a, in, into the actual excavations, and this is a very dangerous vault, it's all crumbling, collapsing all about us. Wow. So it was a very tricky operation. Uh, there's actually a collapsed section in the middle of the vault, which is collapsed from above, and so you have to crawl over the top of it to get inside the continuing vault on the other side. But what the archaeologists found was, that there's a complete dynasty missing. The 21st dynasty, it does not exist in there. Now, what I mean by that is, when an Apis bull is um, inaugurated, it's, uh, you know, it's, there's a date written on the stealer, and then when the bull dies, it's buried in the vaults, and then the stealer is written to tell you what year the bull is buried in what king's reign. So if you have a series of these stele and these burials, you can work out chronology based on the evidence you've got of the dating of the burials. So it's like it's like a, a Dalai Lama. There's only ever one Dalai Lama alive at any, any one time. Sure. And so you can work out a chronology based on the bulls. And what we found was that there was about uh, nine or ten bulls missing from the vaults, completely not there. Mm -hmm. 
And there are a continuous sequence of uh, vaults here. You know, it's not like they could have been buried somewhere else because the con it continues afterwards with uh, another series of, of burials. So you have a gap in the middle along this vault where there is no 21st dynasty mm. and no early 22nd dynasty. Mm. So I looked at this and I scratched my head and I thought, well, this is a bit strange. What does this mean? Why is there no 21st dynasty there? What, what happened to that dynasty? Were they not in charge somehow in in Memphis at Saqqara? Were they somewhere else? Um, why were there no burials in their, in their time? And so that was the first clue, which led me to think that maybe there was something wrong with Egyptian chronology. Maybe this era between the end of the 20th dynasty and the beginning of the 26th dynasty, which we call the third intermediate period, Maybe we'd got that, we'd worked that out all wrong. Maybe there was something about that chronology, that historical period, which we have to re-examine. Wow. Yeah, you know, the thing is then, like, I mean, you've got these wonderful little insightful uh, parts, and, and I, I think I think the thing to say is that that's the key thing for you, uh, the Apis Temple. Um, King of Sorkin II, tell Ooh, us, yes. you know, tell us about this. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. The hun there's a hundred forty year gap here. Um, Another one, yes. Exactly. Another one, and and I see you stitching between the Apis Temple, and, uh, yeah, and and you're stitching all these things together. Um, tell us about King of Sorkin, and then we'll just I want to kind of just say about all the patches and the gaps and uh, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, stick with us, listeners, because this is quite complicated. It is well, a little once we get once we get out the other end of it, I'm sure it'll be a lot clearer. Yeah. Uh, but yes, that same 140 or 134 year gap is exactly the same place where the missing Apis bulls are. It's not in a different era, it's in exactly the same era. Mm. And this was really the crunch to me, because I went to study the tombs that are um, in the city of Tarnus in the eastern delta. And there there's a complex of royal tombs buried inside the temple compound. And what we find is two major complexes built right next to each other. One belongs to the 21st dynasty, and one belongs to the 22nd dynasty. And the principal kings buried in the two tombs are Susenis the first in the 21st dynasty vault, and in the 22nd dynasty vault, we have King Azorkon the second. Now, they're normally about 134 years apart in historical terms between those two. And obviously, the kings of the 22nd dynasty should come after the kings of the 21st dynasty. But what I found was that when you looked at the archaeology and the architecture, the 21st dynasty tomb was actually built after the 22nd dynasty tomb. The, the 22nd dynasty tomb has been cut away in order to accommodate part of the 21st dynasty tomb. And that's completely the reverse of the historical picture. <laughs> so it, it said to me, now hang on a minute, if Azorkon II of the 22nd dynasty is buried and built his tomb before King Susanis of the 21st dynasty, then the two dynasties are in the wrong order. Yeah. Yeah, so Bizarre. I worked out there for what really happened was the two dynasties were actually running contemporary with each other in parallel, which is why there's no 21st dynasty Apis bulls, because they were the contemporary with the 22nd dynasty, and it was the 22nd dynasty who buried the bulls, not the 21st dynasty. Mm -hmm. So that explains the missing bulls. Okay, so all this led me to conclude that in the third intermediate period, these dynasties, the dynasties 21 to 25, were actually mostly overlapping. And what that does, of course, is it shortens the chronology, because if they're not running sequentially, then you have a situation where any of the dynasties which came before the 21st dynasty must be lower in date because these dynasties are all contemporary with each other, overlapping. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th it, it's, this is a no-brainer for me. I mean, this is a no-brainer because you, you've you've showed where this fits in as well as just... It's not just a case of missing time, David. It's the, the, time, yeah. the time is missing plus the... It explains other uh, events as well. Um, well, it, well, it does. I mean, what, it basically, this stuff that I'm telling you now is all part of my PhD thesis, and it's very complicated, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the sort of thing that Egyptologists are even frightened of. You know, they don't actually teach the, the third intermediate period from 21 to 25. Dynast those dynasties, wow. in, uh, as a student, you don't get to learn about them. They jump and avoid this area because it's a quagmire. It's like a dark age. Nobody wants to touch it, wow. and none of, none of the professors know anything about it. So you end up in a situation where you become a very much a specialist in this one field of third intermediate period chronology. And there are probably no more than about 10 people in the world who actually know anything about it, who actually study this period and actually do any work in it. So that in itself is rather sort of like furrow, you know, a bit narrow furrowed. You mean you, you use specialists to actually work on this material. But the consequences of the change that it makes to history mm. are enormous and much broader. It's, you've got ripples coming from this, like ripples. 
Absolutely. Yeah, co- huge consequences. And one of those consequences, above all, is what it does to the biblical story and how the Bible relates now to the Egyptian timeline, which has been reduced by around 300 years, because by shortening the third intermediate period, the new kingdom which comes before it, and all the other dynasties from Dynasty 1 right the way down to Dynasty 20, their dates are now lower because you've squashed and compressed the third intermediate period, Mm -hmm. which normally comes from 1069 BC to 664 BC. Now that's reduced in length. It means that the 90th dynasty, Ramesses II, all the kings before him, King Tut, Archonaut, and all those people, are now lower in date. And so they line up differently with the biblical story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which means you can make more for the derivations. I mean, okay, so the third intermediate period, it's been overextended by... The, the 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 mainstream perspective yeah, by a couple of centuries at least yes. a couple of centuries the twenty fourth twenty second dynasties they were like contemporary and yeah the uh, the third intermediate period should be probably about one hundred forty years that you say would use at least one hundred forty yes that part of it yes and there's other bits and pieces that go along with it that have to be compressed so you end up with Ramesses the second being about 250 to 300 years lower in date than he is in the conventional dating system. Wow. And that means that anything to do with him in the rest of the world now is lower in date as well. Wow. Which, and he was quite an important figure because he, he came in contact with other guys, didn't he? he was... He's a key, he's a key pharaoh. He reigned for 67 years or 66 years. Uh, he was a massive hero in the ancient world. He fought battles everywhere. He, he raised monuments everywhere. And of course, Normally, if you if you remember your Cecil B. DeMille movies, he was the pharaoh of the Exodus. He, yeah. he was the guy that challenged Moses. He was the guy that refused to let the people go. Why? Because his dates are approximately, according to scholars, the time when Moses was alive and when the, the Israelites were in Egypt. So that's how you get that connection. But if you lower his dates now by 300 years, he disconnects from the Bible completely. He's mm-hmm. nothing to do with the pharaoh of the Exodus. He's a different character entirely. Mm-hmm. So it has huge implications. Wow. It makes you wonder what, <laughs> what they got right, like, you know, but I, I guess, like you say, there's these anchor points, uh, David. The second of Thebes is the anchor point. This is the one that, that we're happy and confident with, but there's other ones we're not too sure about. Yeah, that's absolutely right. 664 BC, 664 BC was the time when the Assyrians evaded Egypt mm-hmm. and they burnt the city of Thebes and sacked Thebes. Now, that is a fixed point in history. After that, we're into what we call the the late period or classical period. We're into the Persian era, the Greeks, the Hellenistic age, the Romans. All that is well documented and we don't have a problem with the chronology there. But before 664 BC, we're dependent on this third intermediate period, which is a dark age. And, and you can, you can, you know, it's such a complex era. You could really do anything with the chronology there. And what Bibles, uh, what um, scholars did was they used the Bible to date the beginning of that period. What they did was, and this is a strange thing. Uh, and it's understandable because these guys, you know, who uh, who excavated or went to Egypt 200 years ago, they were biblical scholars. They knew their Bibles and they were looking for evidence for the Bible in Egypt. So it was natural for them to look in the inscriptions when they were deciphered first by Champollion to try to event- identify events in the Bible. And one of the key events in the Bible that you probably your listeners won't necessarily know very much about is that the sacking of the Temple of Solomon mm-hmm. took place in 925 BC, in the, in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. Now, King Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. So this is five years after the death of Solomon, when this pharaoh came up from Egypt called Shishak and plundered the Temple of Solomon, took the gold out of the temple of the, and the palace and took it back to Egypt. Now, if you remember your Indiana Jones uh, Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark movie, yeah. remember the Ark of the Covenant was taken back to Tanis and was buried there in the Well of the Souls and that was by this pharaoh called Shishak. Okay, yeah, so yeah. they even in the movies they use this synchronism between Egypt and the Bible. This, Bi- this the Bible tells us the pharaoh was called Shishak, and he he sacked the temple of Solomon five years after the death of Solomon, and that date is 925 BC according to the biblical dating system. Mm-hmm. So what you have to do then is you say, okay, well who is the Shishak in Egyptian history? And of course, what happened was Champollion, who deciphered the hieroglyphs, went to Egypt the only time he ever went to Egypt before he died. He went to an inscription on the walls of the temples of Karnak and he read the name, the name of a name ring of a conquered city, which was the kingdom of Judah. And he immediately thought, well, this must be the sacking of the temple of Solomon and Jerusalem by Shishak. And lo and behold, the name of the pharaoh on the wall was Shosh- a pharaoh called Shoshank. Which is misleading, misleading, isn't it? This is the misleading. Yeah, yeah. He was the he was the first king of the twenty second dynasty, smack in the middle of this dark age mm-hmm. that we were talking about earlier. So what happened was scholars dated 
the last year of King Shoshenk to 925 BC, they're using the biblical date, identifying him with Shishak. And that date has been fixed like a, a, a setting concrete ever since. So Shoshik I, the founder of the 22nd dynasty, begins his reign in 945 BC. He sacks the Temple of Solomon in 925 BC, and everything else flows on from that. So if that if that synchronism, if that connection between Shishak and Shoshik is wrong, the whole of the chronology of Egypt collapses. It all disintegrates because mm -hmm. it's totally reliant on that biblical date. Mm -hmm. and, and any scholar will tell you that that is a circular argument. Mm -hmm. You cannot use a biblical date to date Egyptian history and then use Egyptian history to date biblical history. That's like <laughs> a circular argument. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's crazy, David, you know, because it's, it's, this is something I never gave. I just, I, I accepted this was all figured out and this is all these kingdoms and no, Third yeah, well, everybody thought it was figured out. Um, <clears throat> scholars have been teaching this for the last 200 years. But, and so, yes, I mean, you know, to try and move an immovable object is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so here we are with something that's been set in concrete, set in stone for donkey's years, and is taught, uh, all yeah. the university students learn this, and yet they don't realize how unstable the whole thing is, that it all depends on this identification of Shoshank with Shishak. And when you look at the inscription, of Shoshank on the walls of Karnak, it is nothing like the biblical story of Shishak. Mm -hmm. Shishak attacks the kingdom of Judah in the south and uh, plunders the temple of Jerusalem, whereas Shoshank attacks the northern kingdom of Israel in the north and doesn't go anywhere near Judah. So although the names sound similar, the two campaigns are completely different. Wow. So it's like comparing apples and oranges. Somebody's made a terrible <laughs> blunder here. You know, you've got, you've got historical evidence on a wall which must be accurate, telling you something which is completely different to the biblical story, and yet scholars equate the two as one event. David, when you were coming up with this theory, or coming out with this theory, I should say, were you like going to yourself, oh, I'm going to rub a few, I'm going to rub a few people up the wrong way, or you, you must yeah, have. Yes, yeah. I was, I was, I was well aware of the possibilities that this would cause a huge row. But I was also rather innocent because I foolishly believed that people in academia would be honest and they would look mm -hmm. at the evidence and say, and look at the evidence and purely look at what the arguments were and either decide whether or not they thought that was a reasonable argument or not or whether they had doubts about it. And what really happened was there was a shutdown going on that the, they tried to starve the, the argument of its of oxygen of publicity. So they sort of shut all the doors, slammed all the doors and said, no, we're not going to change this, we're not going to argue this, but what we're going to do is we're going to ridicule the person who proposed the idea and not the argument. And that's the policy that you often find in academia. They don't want the intellectual challenge. Wow. What they want to do is not to have their cosy world disturbed, not to have them, you know, their, their smooth sea upset and, and waves created. They don't like waves in academia. Mm -hmm. So... Uh... Re really, the only sound thing we can say then is that the the sacking of Thebes is six six four BC is the is the key hinge point and and it is uh, until we start introducing astronomy yeah. and then we get a different picture yeah. because the the thing about the ancient world is that that certain people certain high priests astronomer priests mm -hmm. actually observed phenomena in the sky, unusual sure. phenomena, and eclipses, of course, one of the major things that they noted. Mm. And in, in the past, when they saw an eclipse, they wanted to know what the omen was that was related to that eclipse. So if there was an unusual eclipse and something happened, let's say the king of Babylon died or there was an invasion of, of Babylon by the Hittites or whatever it was, and it occurred just after an eclipse, then they wrote a tablet and said, next time this eclipse occurs on this day, with these events, beware the king of Babylon because he's going to get killed by the Hittites or there's going to be an invasion. Mm. So they predicted that whenever this eclipse occurred on the same day, the same event would occur. Mm -hmm. So the, they call this omen, they call these omen texts. Yeah, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, the Akkadians, they, these all guys, these, these guys loved astronomy, didn't they? And they, and, they did. And they have a they believe, Yeah, they believed in the, 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 that these events marked omens, marked events in history. And, as well, and so if, if they're predicting an event in the future, uh, it's, a re, it's a repetition of an event which happened in the past. So if you know when the Hittites invaded and destroyed Babylon, uh, and you can find an eclipse on that particular day by using computer programs, you can date the fall of Babylon exactly. Mm, mm. And, and these, that's independent of the Egyptian dating. 
Yeah, and this is the thing. We know for a fact that these guys have it in their record. There's one thing, the, the Babylonians, the Akkadians, the Assyrians, they took a lot of records. They, we have a very rich wealth of these guys documenting everything from... I think they can even find some comments in the record as well. Um, they, there's an awful lot because they have this ama- amazing script called cuneiform, mm. which is uh, where you impress upon damp clay tablets mm-hmm. with a little reed, uh, and they they write with this. It's not like the hieroglyphs in Egypt; it's very much more uh, Morse code like graphic. Yes, it's it's like a script. It's a mm. proper script, mm. and and we have thousands of these tablets that have been found in in Mesopotamia in modern Iraq, uh, which a lot of them are astronomy based and omen texts because. Mm. What happened was the the astronomer priests would see this event and then the king would re- require a prediction mm. uh, to decipher it. And so they would kill a lamb and examine its liver and see how it was displayed. And that's called extispacy. And from that, they would interpret the event. So they're, they're using the the event in the sky. They're using the liver extispacy to actually work out what the event means. And then they would tell the king and inform the king what to expect. Wow, how these, then are, these then are archived, these documents are archived, and we can use them. So if it says a, a particular eclipse occurred in March or on a particular day or whatever, at, at, at sunset or at sunrise or whatever, that's a very specific event, and you can go and find it using astronomy programs. Wow. Okay, so we'll, let's talk some of these uh, astronomy calculations, because this affects the Armana, Armana period, the, the Armana letters. Yeah, that's that's true. That's one of the things we can use, although that one has uh, an issue with it. I mean, it's not as firm as some of the, the earlier ones, which we can deal with later. Mm-hmm. But what happened there was there's a city called Ugarit, which is on the coast of modern Syria, just north of Lebanon. Mm-hmm. And there was a very wealthy city there and they had tablets and the, the, the whole place was destroyed by fire. And they, when the archaeologists excavated, they found a small tablet which recorded an eclipse at sunset on a particular day. And the eclipse was still eclipsed when the sun sank. So you could imagine the priest standing there looking over the sea, seeing the sun setting, and it completely eclipsed by the moon and disappearing below the sea, below the horizon. Now, that is a very extraordinary, unique event because you've got to be at that particular place on that particular day and the sun has got to be eclipsed as it's, as it's set. Okay? Wow. And, and what happens? Well, on the back of the tablet, they examined a, a liver of a, a lamb and they warned that it was going to be a real danger for the city. And lo and behold, in the Amarna letters, there's a correspondence written to Pharaoh Akhenaten, which mentions the burning down of the palace and the city at this very time. Wow. So there you go. You've got you've got an astronomy uh, event, and you've got something that can date a particular year in the reign of Akhenaten in Egypt, and that date is 1012 BC. And now 1012 BC is several centuries wow. later yep. than the normal date for yeah. Akhenaten, yeah. who's normally 1350 BC. Yeah. So you can see how it works. You can use astronomy to re-examine the dating of Egyptian events mm. and redate the Egyptian pharaohs, ignoring the biblical synchronism of Shishak. Mm. The beauty of art, well, you, you know I use archaeoastronomy too, David, but I mean, uh, yeah. the beauty of archaeoastronomy is it's, it's, it's pretty rock solid, like, you know, it's, it, you can just wind back the stars, you can wind back procession, and do these retro calculations and, and tie these in. Uh, tell us about Akhenaten, this guy, I find this guy fascinating, I mean, he gets a lot of bad press in, in, uh, in ancient times as well, I mean, this guy, they tried to screw up him out of the record. You're right. Well, I'm not a big fan, so beware. Okay. okay. Um, Akhenaten was a dreamer. Mm. Okay. He was the son of Amenhotep the third. He wasn't in line to succeed the king. Uh, the king's elder son, Thutmose, died prematurely. We don't know why. And then Akhenaten found himself as king of Egypt. And he was uh, not a well boy. He wasn't healthy. No, he doesn't uh, look he at had, it. He had, he had a lot of illnesses, and we're not quite sure what the illnesses were, but they seem to have something to do with hydrocephalus or something like that. Morphans even. And, and morphans, yeah, morphan syndrome. Um, so there's, there's, there's all sorts of issues with why he looked the way he looked. Some of it could also be to do with the, the style of art at the time, that this man w- was very, very influenced by what was going on in the Mediterranean. Wow. So, in fact, uh, he had contact with the Mycenaean world and the Cretan world, the Minoan world. Mm-hmm. And he even had mercenaries who were actually from that part of the world in his bodyguard to protect him. So he had a lot of influence with what was going on in Crete with the Minoans. Now, you know Minoan art is very flowing oh, and rich. Beautiful, and, yeah. And it's exotic. It's mm. very exotic. And yet there's a dark side to Minoan history. They weren't the hippies that everybody thinks they were. 
we have found very clear evidence of, of child cannibalism in, in Crete, where the, the people of Knossos and elsewhere sacrificed young children and ate them. Um, so they're not God. the pretty, pretty hippies we all think they are. Mm. However, one of the things was very important at this time, at the time of Akhenaten and his relationship with the Aegean world, was opium. Wow. Okay, so they were actually imbibing opium. And it may well be that the, what we see in Amarna art has got to do with the king's own indulgences with the drug, mm -hmm. that he saw a different way to everybody else. And he gave instructions that the art should portray what he saw in his visions. So he was a bit of a sort of prophet, a hippie prophet. And he he wanted to change the way that the Egyptian society and religion worked and the kingship worked. He wanted to go back to an earlier time, a simpler time, where the worship of the sun god was the key element. And in his case, he wanted to worship the god called Aten. Now, Aten is the sun disk itself, or the light of the sun. It's not like Ra, who is the, the sun traveling across the sky. It's the specific orb and the light which he wanted to worship. And it's wow. a very early god. And he wanted to resurrect the idea of this, this one god being the key god and the only, the, the only real god to worship. Now, he wasn't strictly speaking a monotheist. He did still um, eat princesses of stealer that was found at the Serapium, worshipping an Apis bull. So he wasn't a 100% Artanist. He was also, to a degree, he maintained other religious cults around Egypt, but he restricted particularly the cult of Ammon at Thebes. And that was more like a political uh, thing. He wanted to stifle and... Uh, um, Com uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, to, to oppress mm. the Amun cult's priesthood in Karnak because they were too powerful and he didn't like them very much and he wanted to move away from Thebes and go and build a new capital at Amarna and start this whole new cults thing mm. around the, the Arten and his father, the III, who he equated with the Arten. So he was almost like a father worship. He deified his own his own father to become the Arten and he, was beca he became the only high priest who could speak to the art and communicate with the art. And so he had control over the whole of the religion. Wow. So it, it, because he was doing this, he made a lot of enemies, as you can imagine, with the priesthood and the, and the nobility. And it was all a bit of a crackpot, crazy idea. And it lasted about 12 years altogether. Uh, he reigned for 17 years, but at the beginning he was a good boy, and then later he changed everything. Uh, and what he did do was he ignored completely the Egyptian empire. He did not look after the military. He did not support all the vassal kings in the north, in Canaan and in the south. He let them go. So what happened in his, his period was that the whole of the empire collapsed. And that's really the great, the great sin of, of the great heresy that he, he, he brought upon Egypt and where he was hated so much by the Egyptians after he died mm. because he actually lost the empire. And it was the, it was the 90th dynasty Ramesside kings, Ramesses II and his father Seti I, who had to recover the empire and had to fight to get it back. Which is why they, you know, hit them and Horam have destroyed the, the memory of, uh, tried to eradicate the memory of Arkhanaten because of what he'd done. It wasn't so much the religion changes that really mattered. It was the fact that he let the whole empire go. Yeah. He let Egypt down. He was the catalyst. He was the catalyst to the destruction of uh, further events. So did that solar eclipse then have a direct effect because he was worshipping the sun? I'm just trying to simplify that. But. No. Uh, what, what that basically was is the letter that was sent to him uh, mentioning the burning down of the palace. And we know that the palace was destroyed immediately after this, this tablet was written in Ugarit with the mm -hmm. solar, solar eclipse. Yes, yeah. That was sent to him in, in the 12th year of King Arkhanaten. Wow. So we can date the 12th year of Arkhanaten to 1012 BC. Wow. Get the idea. So it's yeah. like a specific link. And then instead of him being in 1315 BC, he's now in, in 1012 BC. Now you ask yourself this question. Mm. If he was reigning in 1012 BC, what's happening biblically at this time? Who, yeah. who in the Bible who's is he, around in 1012 BC? Who's he in touch with? Who's he talking yeah, to? Who's, yeah, who's he communicating with? And the answer to that is King Saul and King David. Wow. Right now we've got something really interesting going because in King David's time, if you read the Psalms, we have a uncanny, amazing thing that Archonata's hymn to the sun, his great famous prayer, where he eulogizes the solar disk, the sun and the light, is identical to Psalm 104 that was written by David. Wow. So, so now you get something really weird happening. The connections start to happen here. You find that the empire of Egypt collapses exactly when the united monarchy period in, in, in Israel comes alive. You get the, the, the Israelites 
overthrowing the Philistines, who were the vassals of the Egyptians, and taking over the country. And at exactly this time, we have letters in the Amarna collection coming to Egypt saying, for God's sakes, come and help us, send some Egyptian troops, because the Habiru, the Hebrews, are taking over the cities. Oh. And then Akhenaten ignores these letters. And it's this failure on the part of Akhenaten which allows the Israelite tribes to become a kingdom, to have kings and start to rule, and to get a, an empire of their own through King David. It's all because of the weakness of Akhenaten who lets the empire go. Wow. I, I often hear Akhenaten is linked with Tutankhamun, which is speculation, I think, and also that he was possibly the Moses in the Bible. What do you think of that, David? <laughs> well, the Moses in the Bible doesn't work for me at all, on so many either. different le levels. First of all, chronology doesn't fit. Let's let's put that one in. Yeah. 1012 BC is not the time of the Exodus. 1447 BC is the time of the Exodus, so it mm -hmm. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the first thing. The yeah. second thing is when you compare the lives of Moses to Akhenaten, they're totally different. Mm. Akhenaten was buried in Egypt. He was a king of Egypt. It, Moses was not a king of Egypt, and he left Egypt, and he was buried on Mount Nebo mm. in, in Jordan. So mm -hmm. then they don't match in, what's, in any way whatsoever. I mean, the, the, the idea doesn't work. As for Tutankhamun being the son of Akhenaten, I don't believe it. The I think Zahir again. has forged the evidence on that. Yeah. Um, there is very clear evidence that uh, Tutankhamun himself claimed to be the son of Amenhotep III, which makes him a brother of Akhenaten, not his son. Wow. So, um, you know, there are inscriptions, and, and, uh, and Tutankhamun never mentions Akhenaten, he only mentions Amenhotep III as his father. And it's possible that uh, one of uh, Amenhotep III's daughters was his mother. So, we, we don't know whether this DNA evidence is right or wrong, because it was done by Zahi, we really can't tell whether it's real yeah. or not, yeah. you know, because he he was tempted to always uh, yeah. have an agenda, and the evidence usually was brought to match his agenda. I think so. Zai, he always liked to link up names, famous names with famous names in ancient Egypt. He he always well, wanted. Well, true, but Tutankhamun was the successor of Akhenaten. There's no doubt about that. Mm. But the question is, um, who was his father, mm. and why did he receive such a fantastic burial? Although it was a rushed burial, we know that, and in a tiny tomb, mm. if you look at the wealth inside the tomb that was piled inside that tomb, there's got to be a good reason why the Egyptians gave so much to him in his burial compared to other pharaohs. Now, I know we haven't got many pharaohs' intact tombs to compare it to, but what we do have, and what we have found, uh, does not seem to be of the quality of Tutankhamun's burial goods and uh, there was no doubt at all that as far as the, the population were concerned and the priesthood were concerned, that Tutankhamun was the saviour of Egypt. They regarded him as such, probably because he restored the cult of Amun and, and got rid of the Artanist heresy of Akhenaten. So, you know, there's a, a good reason why he may not wish to be claimed to be the son of Akhenaten. But every single inscription we do find, he calls himself the son of Amenhotep III, who was Akhenaten's father, and therefore, that makes Tutankhamun uh, a brother of Akhenaten, a younger brother of Akhenaten. Wow. Wow. He gets a. You know, the funny thing is, when I say he, I, I like him in terms of, in terms of a interesting period to look at, um, David. But it, you know, so we're saying now that these, yes, yeah, yeah. so these are. are yes. Go on. Sorry, David. The Al uh, the Armada letter. Then, um, mm. this is linked to the Book of Samuel. I think it is, and uh, that's exactly when I think this whole uh, series of events of the Arcan uh, the Alamana period took place. The time of King Saul's rise, when he was chosen by the people. You know the word, the name Shaul or Saul means yeah. asked for in Hebrew. Wow. So the people asked for a king. They asked Samuel for a king, like every other nation. So he's asked for. So that's not his real name that he was he carried in life. It's a sort of traditional name or a legendary name for him. Just like Solomon, the name Solomon means peace. It's from Shalom. Okay, so that name probably wasn't the name he carried in life. It's just the name that's given to him by tradition. Mm. So these, these early Hebrew kings probably had different names when they were alive. Now, we do know that the king who ru ruled in the hill country at the time of Akhenaten was a king called Labayu, or Labaya. And Labaya means the lion of and then a deity. Well, we could actually say that Labaya, the Yah at the end, is actually the short form of the name Yahweh or the god Jehovah. So it would mean the Lion of Yahweh. Now, that would be a very suitable name for the first king of Israel. And it's amazing that this guy, Labiah, this king, did exactly the same things as King Saul did. And it's all recorded in the Amarna letters. So he had a son who, who 
was uh, a friends with the Habiru uh, rebel, the Hebrew rebel. And that, of course, is, king, uh, is David before he became king, who had ha held out in the hill country and Saul tried to get him. And his son, uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, was actually in league with David against his, his father's wishes. And we read that in the Alamana letters. Wow. We read that about the Bayou and his son. And he actually writes to Pharaoh and says that his son, he did not know his son was consorting with the Habiru chieftain or the Hebrew chieftain, which is David. And then we find later on that Labiah, Labiah and Saul both died on the same mountain in the same place in a, in a battle against the, the kings of the lowland regions, you know. So the two of them uh, are historically um, amazingly similar. Mm. And we find lots of scholars now saying that uh, Saul, they, they, they keep the two individuals, Saul and Labiah, separately by several hundred years. But they, cut, they, say, they refer to Saul as being the last Labiah and that the two kings are almost identical, but they're separate, separated by 300 years. Mm. So they can't be the same person. Mm. You know, so that's the iron of it all. You know, once you've taken out the 300 years of erroneous chronology, which has been added by scholars, and you reduce the dates of Akhenaten, then Saul becomes Labiah. Mm. He is the same person. Wow. Yeah, the 18th dynasty didn't begin in, in 1570. It was like 370, no. 370 years out, David. Like, it's a bit of a, it's a, a, yes. it's, a, it's a bit of a blunder, isn't it? <laughs> it is a bit of a blunder. And I'm not saying it's exactly correct. I mean, you know, there may be faults in my revised chronology. That's entirely possible. But I think the general thrust of what I'm doing really does pay dividends, not just in terms of the Bible, but all over the ancient world. For example, uh, let me let me take you to the Greek world for a moment. Mm. You know the story of the Trojan War. You know King Agamemnon was the king yes. of Mycenae. Yes, yes. Okay, and he fought a war against the Trojans, and and all that happened in the great period called the Bronze Age or the Heroic Age of Greece. Mm. Well, what happened then was that the Egyptians, or specifically the Egyptian arche the archaeologist Flinders Petrie, found Mycenaean pottery at Tel Alamana, and he thought, right. Now, we know the date of Telenomano, based on Egyptian chronology, is 1350 BC. So if we find Mycenaean pottery here, we can date Mycenae in Greece to 1350 BC, and we can therefore date the Trojan War to around that period. Okay, now by doing that, he then created in Greek history a 350-year Dark Age, because it suddenly separated the Trojan War from the time of Homer by 350 years. Wow. And that was directly a result of Egyptian dating, imposing the dates for Agamemnon and Mycenae on, on Greek history from the Egyptian dating system. So we then end up with a 350-year dark age in Greece, which we can't explain, where there's no pottery, uh, there's nothing going on, none of the cities are, are, are populated, and you find that the, the, the Trojan, uh, the city of Troy is destroyed and then abandoned for 350 years, and suddenly it's rebuilt again with exactly the same pottery that was found 350 years earlier. No change whatsoever. Like nobody, you know, the people had gone away and continued to make the same pottery for 350 years. They came back again and, and rebuilt the city with exactly the same pottery they used earlier, 350 years earlier. Wow. It's crazy. It's a nonsense. Yeah, you know, it's, I'm just thinking of the ripples again here. It's like, it's, it's just, it's when you start, you know, making insight into the Greeks or the Hittites or mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. It's like, People just think, okay, big deal. The chronology changes in Egypt. They got a couple of kings wrong. It's not as simple as that. It's everything no, wrong. It's everything. not. It even even goes to, over to, Tro uh, to to Rome as well. I, I know you know that um, yeah. the great hero who survived the Trojan War was called Aeneas. Yes. Uh, the, he was the last surviving Trojan warrior mm -hmm. uh, after the sack of Troy. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who went to Rome and founded the Roman kingdom. Wow. That according to traditions. And yet you have him arriving in the conventional dating scheme, you're having arriving in the Bronze Age in around 1300 or 1200 BC, and yet Rome is not founded as a kingdom until 700 BC or right. 800 BC. So there's another gap of yeah. 400 years. So, you know, so again, it's all, it's all caused. Roman history is disrupted. Greek history is disrupted. Biblical history is disrupted. All these civilizations, their chronologies are wrecked by a false Egyptian chronology. Sure. Okay, the big question, David, talk to me about the Exodus and how this fits in with the new chronology. Okay, well, that, this is this is where it really gets exciting. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the the Bible, uh, according to biblical dating, dates the Exodus around, let's say, for argument's sake, 1447, 1446, whatever, around that date. Now, these dates are worked out by scholars, and 
they are what we find in the biblical text. We can we actually have dates for all the kings and stuff, and we can work it out pretty much based on the biblical evidence. Now, we can't necessarily trust the biblical evidence, so we we have to put a question mark on it. But at least we've got a ballpark figure. Well, let's say that the Exodus took place in 1450 BC, for argument's sake. Now, with this revised chronology of Egypt, okay, we're no longer looking at Ramesses II as the pharaoh of the Exodus. We're looking to an earlier period when it, what dynasty is in charge in 1450 BC according mm. to this new dating scheme mm. using astronomy and all these other things to date it. Mm -hmm. The answer to that is it's the 13th dynasty and the people will be saying well what the heck's the 13th dynasty? I've never heard of the 13th dynasty. Probably people can't even name a single king of the 13th dynasty. But if you then look at what happens in that period of the late 12th dynasty, 13th dynasty through to the beginning of the new kingdom, the 18th dynasty, what we find in Egypt is the place is full, absolutely s overloaded with Semitic peoples speaking speaking s Semitic languages. Mm. We find cities full of Habiru or Hebrew peoples from Canaan. We find uh, graves of Semitic peoples, non-Egyptians, living in the eastern delta in the area the Bible calls Goshen, the land that the Bible says Joseph and Jacob settled the people of Israel, and they lived there for several hundred years before they left under Moses and the Exodus. So instead of looking in the 19th dynasty where we find no evidence for any Semitic peoples living in, in Egypt, uh, in, in large quantities in big cities, when we look back to the 13th dynasty, we find that the, the, the cities are full of these people. One particular city called Avaris, which is in the land of Goshen, it's been excavated by the Austrians now for the last 30, 40 years, and they have found amazing things there. I mean, th let me let me tell you a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The first thing is they found as I say, lots and lots of graves with Semitic peoples buried in them, lying on their sides with their knees up towards their chest, which is a, a way that Semitic people are buried, not Egyptians. As you know, Egyptians lie on their backs with their hands down their sides. The, that, so these graves are clearly of foreigners from the north. Wow. They have Canaanite pottery. They have bronze daggers and, and axes, which are typical of what we call Middle Bronze 2A, which is the, the sort of like Canaanite style of, of pottery and weaponry. Uh, so they're typically uh, Canaanite Semitic peoples. They're shepherds. They they sacrifice sheep in, the, in front of their graves, and this is the first time sheep are introduced into the into Egypt. So, um, and when did sheep arrive in Egypt in the Bible? They arrive with Jacob when he brings his tribe down into Egypt, and they settle there in the land of Goshen. So that that again matches the whole story. And then we find at the end of the 13th dynasty, in the reign of a king called Dudimos, uh, uh, a very insignificant individual, but notice that the second half of his name is Mos, which is the same as Moses. Okay, in his time, Egypt collapsed. And what happened was there was a mass plague all over the city of Avaris. We find pits with people or bodies just thrown into them on top of each other. Wow. Uh, no grave goods, nothing. They're just thrown in, emergency burials, get these guys buried because they're going to contaminate the rest of the population. We have to hurry up and bury them. And then immediately afterwards, the entire Semitic population who live in that city disappear. They just pick up their belongings and they go. And the city's abandoned. Now that's exactly the same as the biblical story of the Exodus, where the Egyptian firstborns are die of the tenth plague and they they have to be buried rapidly and then immediately afterwards the Israelites leave in, and walk into off into Sinai. That's exactly what we see in the archaeology of Avaris at the end of the thirteenth dynasty. Wow. So it, it matches the story really well. And then if you go forty years or so later in history and we come to Palestine, we come to Canaan, and we find that is exactly when the city of Jericho was destroyed. Just like in the story of Joshua, where they the city walls collapsed and they burn the city to the ground, and it's abandoned for several hundred years, cursed. That's exactly what we find in the Middle Bronze Age, the great big city of Jericho. The walls collapse outwards. Yes, The yes. whole place is burnt to the ground, and it's not reoccupied again for several hundred years, exactly like the biblical story. And you can do that with all the cities in Canaan that the Israelites destroyed. They're all destroyed at this time from, from the evidence of archaeology. So, so you, you have, it matches perfectly. You have the Jericho as Tel El uh, Tel El Sultan. Tel El Sultan. Tel Sultan yeah. Yes, that's right. And you go up to Hatzor, which is one of the the major cities in the north of Israel. It's called the the greatest kingdom, uh, greatest city in the kingdom in the Bible at that time. That city is also burnt to the ground at that time. And when the archaeologists there excavated the Middle Bronze Age palace, they found a tablet 
in cuneiform, in this writing we talked about earlier, naming the king who was in the palace when it was destroyed. And the name on the tablet is Yabin. And the name of the king who was killed by Joshua when the city of Hatzor was destroyed is Jabin. Wow. So again, you actually have the name of the king that Joshua shoved his sword into. It's found on a tablet in the burnt, destroyed palace of Hatzor at the end of the Middle Bronze Age. Powerful stuff, this David, because it, the, the insight just keeps going and going. I mean, yeah, um, it is it is astonishing, and that's why I yeah I've got to believe. Although I, I have to say now, I'm not a I'm not a religious fanatic. I'm not a, actually a believer. I have to say that you know this I'm is sort of agnostic. Like <laughs> I view I view that the whole uh, Bible thing as a very historic, interesting historical document, and mm. I'm I'm interested to find out what parts of it are real and what parts of it are not. But I don't I don't have faith in that in that sense. Um, mm. You know, you define faith as believing in something without evidence. Well, I have to have evidence. That's yeah. that's my faith. Oh, I, I mean, my my religion is history. I need to <laughs> see the evidence for it. Yeah, I have so. Uh, Yes. I'm not doing it from a religious point of view. Yeah. Oh, I know, David. I mean, this is, I, I can tell from reading your book, this is a, it's a fanaticism of history of anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but what I see, what I see, the evidence I see for the biblical stories in the archaeology, once the timeline has been revised, convinces me that the basis of the history of, of the Bible lies in history, that the, the events certainly happen. They're not fictional. They're not mythological. They're not a Harry Potter novel. They are something much more concrete than that. Now, I'm not, as you probably noticed by reading the book, I don't mention miracles. I don't talk about, you know, miracle happenings or something supernatural. I talk about people. I talk about their relationship to their God, sure. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the events of history, but I don't talk about the the religious side of it too much um, yeah. because that's not for me. I'm not a theologian. I'm a historian. Yeah. So I have to deal with historical facts and archaeology. So that's where I'm coming from. That's not to say, of course, that this does not help people with faith to confirm their faith and also to allow them to challenge those minimalists who turn around and say well the whole biblical story is a harry potter novel it's all fiction it's all fairy tale because we find no evidence for it in the archaeology but the reason they don't find any evidence for it is because they're looking in the t wrong time for it yeah they're looking in the time of ramesses the second and it's not going to be found there because it got to be found much earlier in the 13th dynasty yeah they're looking in the right place at the wrong time david Exactly, exactly correct. You know, wow. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting situation and it's a, it's an interesting debating issue as well as to whether or not, uh, the Egyptian timeline is correct, in which case the Bible is wrong, mm. or whether the Egyptian timeline is wrong and the Bible is correct. Mm. You mentioned the uh, Varys as well. I have, I have your other book, The Lords of Avaris. I can't wait to read that. Oh, you do? I do. Ah. I have it behind me. I haven't got to it yet, but I will do now. And this is going to be a nice follow-on book for me, David. Right. It's uh, going to deal with all the Indo-European issues of the, of the arrival of the, the Hittites in the region and yeah. the story of the Trojan War and the Romans, origins of Rome and all that stuff. And it all based on this revised timeline. Mm. Yeah, because and and this is where you follow the ripple of the timeline. You know the way I look at it, David. It's like mm -hmm. the existing picture that we have been given uh, by the Egyptologists, mainstream academia, I should say, uh, has been fuzzy, and we thought it was clear. And now that we see it with a clearer eyes, we see it with like this uh, this clearer picture. It's like uh, it's 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 not fuzzy. Like we have this beautiful. Well, I wish that was true. I mean that is that that's the way I see it, and that's the way that so many of the people who've read my books see it, and mm. uh, and we're it's a growing body of people who are converting to this new new idea, mm. but in academia they it's, don't see it at all. It's they so... just they just close the door on it. So, I mean they they they're wow. not prepared to accept it. There's nobody embrace it at all, David. <clears throat> Younger academics uh, are opening their minds to it because yeah. they're not. You know, they're not sort of like ingrained with the old ideas and traditions. Yeah. But when it comes to the older generation uh, that were in uh, universities and are still teaching today, they they will not change their minds. But that's always the way. <clears throat> in a debate, it's very rare that one side will, will actually agree to change their ideas and go over to the other side. It's extremely unlikely that ever happens. Yeah. I think it was, uh, it was um, Max Planck, the famous physicist, who famously quoted, and said that if a new idea comes along, you have to wait for the generation in whose, to, to, in whose time the idea is proposed to die off before that idea will be accepted. And that's usually the case. Yeah, You have true. to wait for one generation to pass for a new generation to accept a, an idea. 
Yeah, you know, I've been very excited, David, in the last, certainly in the last 10 years, but I mean, 20, the last 20 years has been revelatory for the whole of ancient Egypt, from Hancock, Bouval, and their stuff, and a whole host of other stuff, even ancient mysteries of Gebekli Tepe, and, sure. you know, sure. it's, it's, we're in changing times now, David, and I'm really hopeful for the next generation, I really well, am. Well, it is, it is interesting. I mean, I went to Gebekli Tepe way before everybody else did. Mm. <laughs> I think I was there in 2001, or whatever wow. it was, to, something like that, uh, and, uh, cause I was, uh, going into eastern Turkey on a, an expedition, mm. and, uh, I went there, and I saw the site for myself, and it, and it is a shock. Let's, let's face it, to any, but any archaeologist, any historian, Gebekli Tepe is a shock. Yeah. And it doesn't, it just does not compute with what we know of ancient history. So mm -hmm. how to explain it? That's a very difficult question. Yeah. <clears throat> it is undoubtedly, um, in my view, a gathering place for pre-pottery Neolithic hunter gatherers. In other words, this is well before the pottery age, well before pottery was invented. It's well before farming. Mm. Uh, and anything like that, uh, any agriculture. So it seems to be a clan gathering place for some rituals. And there are no burials there. I don't know if you know that. There's actually no bodies anywhere at that site. Yeah. Nothing's, nothing being found in the way of skeletal remains. I don't think they lived there either, David, did they? No, they didn't. They didn't. It was and, a worship. And of course, it was, it was all buried at the end of its time, <laughs> that, uh, intentionally buried. That's the biggest what, mystery of all, David, for me. Yeah, well, what, the thing for me that I, I, I'm sad about is that when people look at Quebecli Tepe, they try to find astro astronomical links to the so-called temples, the round buildings the, mm -hmm. with, the, with the pillars. Mm -hmm. And they're not using their eyes, because when I went to the site, I noticed that as you go through towards the site, which is on your left-hand side, on the side of the hill, it's on the top of the hill, mm -hmm. on the side of the hill, sloping away from it, looking right across eastwards across the mountains mm -hmm. there is a platform of rock a huge great big slab of rock and all over that rock were holes cut and and rectangles and slots for objects to be placed into and it's quite clear to me that that was an astronomical observation point wow. for rituals something mm -hmm. like stonehenge where they would the crowd would stand there and align these objects that were placed in these holes mm -hmm. and, and these slots mm -hmm. to the sunrise, or to whether it was the equinoxes or the solstices. And that's where people should be looking for these strong astronomical connections, not in the temples. The temples themselves will have no view of astronomy from within them because they were completely surrounded by walls. There was no, there was no actual observational points within those buildings. Yeah. And I think, so I, I think, think people aren't looking in the right way at that site. I think a lot of people are making conclusions based on only 5% of it being uncovered as well. I mean, only 5%. Well, there's that, there's that, yes, there's that as well. But how to explain it and what it's doing there, yeah. that's another matter. I mean, I wrote a book called Legend the Genesis of Civilization where I, I looked at the origins of ancient Egypt, but I went much further back and I looked at the book of Genesis and mm. I, I went to look for effectively whether there was a location somewhere on this planet that was equated with this place called Eden. Now, you know from reading your book of Genesis, those of you who have read the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. that it's a very, very matter-of-fact description of where it's located. Mm -hmm. It's not somewhere in the clouds. It's not somewhere underneath the earth. It's yeah. on the earth. And Adam and Eve, whoever they were, whoever these people were, sure. they left this place and never went back to it. Okay, mm -hmm. so in, in chapter 2 of Genesis, you actually read that the location of Eden is where the four rivers that they mention in the Bible in Genesis actually have their headwaters. Yeah. Now, two two of those rivers we know. One's called the Euphrates, and the other one's called, called the Tigris. Tigris. Yeah. And they flow down into Mesopotamia, into modern Iraq. But if you trace their sources, they, the rivers back to their sources, they start up beyond the Zagros Mountains, which separate Iran from uh, Iraq. That great range of mountains. They, their sources are beyond that to the north. In a region we, which was ancient Armenia, mm. Urumania is called, and it's now part of Western Iran. So if you go to that area where Lake Van is in eastern Turkey or Lake Urumia is in, in Western Iran, that's the land of Eden where those two rivers have their sources. And by going there myself, I went up, I think I did nine expeditions into this region. I left from southern uh, Mesopotamia in uh, Susiana, which is sort of like to the east of modern Iraq in southern Iran in the plain there, where I left there in my vehicles, and we traveled up through the mountain passes of the Zagros Mountains, going through the get the seven gates that lead to heaven, to paradise, wow. and we actually found the location of the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Now, you may think that sounds crazy, but actually, 
what we found was we found the other two rivers in the book of Genesis and their sources, mm. the Pishon and the Gihon. And we found the land of Cush, which is mentioned uh, from the, which the, the Gihon flows. And we found the land of Nod, where Cain, Cain is exiled when he kills his brother Abel. It's still there today. And we even found the river that flows to the Garden of Eden. And, the, and, and looking, you stand in that, in that valley and you look by the river and you look up and there's the mountain of God that's mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's all still there. And I'll tell you where it is now. It's actually, if you go to your Google Earth or Google Maps, you can find it located where the city of Tabriz is today. Tabriz. Ancient city of Tabriz, wow. which is the end of the Silk Road, the western end of the Silk Road to wow. China. And it's there in that valley where the so-called Garden of Eden was located. The place where whoever these people were originally lived before they migrated southwards into Mesopotamia over those mountains. Mm. So, and we, we can trace the pottery development from that region down into Mesopotamia. And it's, of course, why, uh, in Mesopotamia, which of course is a great flat valley with no mountains at all, it's why the gods of the Mesopotamians, of the Sumerians, had their houses on top of mountains that were built by humans. Wow. The Tower of Babel is one example. Yeah. The ziggurats, what people uh, falsely call them pyramids, but the ziggurat tower temples of Babylonia and of Mesopotamia, of Assyria, have the house of the gods on top of them, just like in Mesoamerica where you have the, the god's house on top of the, 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 the temples there. It's the house of the god is on top of a mountain. That tells you that the people worshipped gods who came from the mountains. If the gods came from the mountains, the people must have come from the mountains too. Mm, mm. You don't you don't find people wor uh, in flatlands worshiping god gods who lived in mountains unless they came from the mountains originally. A lot of people so, a lot of people just tried to associate Babylon Babylon with with the Tower of Babel just by name, wasn't it? Yeah, but unfortunately that's a mistake. Yeah, that doesn't uh, that doesn't make sense. Babylon the Babylon the word Babylon means uh, it originally in in, in in the Akkadian language is Bab Ilu which means the gate of the gods, mm. okay? It's in other words, it's the gate entrance towards the city of Babylon. But in fact, there was another Bab Ilu. Uh, in, in Babylon itself had two names, or the temple area had two names. One of them was Bab Ilu, the gate of the gods, and the other one was Nunki. Mm -hmm. Nunki means the mighty place in mm -hmm. Sumerian. Mm -hmm. N-U-N dot K-I. K-I is place or earth, and Nun means mighty. Now, there was another city, in southern Mesopotamia, in the land of Sumer, which was called Nunki. And that was the place where the first tower temple was constructed, the first ziggurat was constructed. And it's a place we call Eridu. And it's right by the Gulf of, uh, the Persian Gulf, or the, uh, the Arabian Gulf, right at the head of the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And that is the place where the Sumerian traditions say the first kings arrived to found the first city on earth. Wow. That is the place where they built the first ziggurat. And guess what? The ziggurat was never finished, it was abandoned, and the people left the place, just like the story of the Tower of Babel. So that place was called Nunki, and later, much later, a thousand years later, a new city was built called Babylon, which was also called Nunki, and that's why there's a confusion about the Tower of Babel, because it wasn't the Tower of Babel, it was the Tower of Nunki, not the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. So the original Tower of Babel, the original Nunki, was at Eridu, and that was built by a king we call uh, in the text was called En Merkar. Now, this, I hope you're not confused by this. En Merkar, uh, the word Kar at the end, the Sumerian word Kar means hunter in, in Sumerian. Sumerian, yeah. So it's En Mer the hunter. Okay. Now, you take away the vowels because ancient Akkadian was not written with these vowels. In, sorry, Hebrew was not written with vowels. You get N M R for En Mer, the hunter. And N M R. The hunter is Nimrod, the mighty hunter, who built the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. So wow. we actually can identify Nimrod, the, the legendary Nimrod of the Bible, with King en Merkar of Sumer, who built the Tower of Eridu, Nunki, and it was abandoned and left abandoned and unfinished, exactly like the biblical story. Wow. Wow, how insightful. Have you, have you been up as far as, what's that place uh, called in uh, Armenia, Stonehenge? They have like a Stonehenge place as well. Have you been up as far as that? 
David? Uh, is that in, in modern Armenia? Because modern Armenia is further north than ancient Armenia. Mm. I, I've only been as far as the west, west, northwestern Iran, mm. uh, the Tabriz Valley. And oh, Armenia okay. modern is further north. But the Armenian Christians have their cathedrals mm. and their, their patriarch in the area that I've been to. So I'm not oh, quite see. sure where this, where this place is you're referring to. It could yeah. be in modern Armenia. Uh, yeah, because the borders. The I am. Yeah, the borders have changed. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah, so Urumania, the ancient Urumania, which became Armenia, classical Armenia, is further south than the modern Armenia. Yeah. For me, Middle Eastern history is some of the most fascinating, David. It's absolutely inspiring and, you know, insightful. Well, it, and... Yeah, it is for me too. I mean, I, I, I love history with a passion. And, and the amazing thing is that when I was at school, I was, I was raised a Catholic when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as usual, when you do, you become a lapsed Catholic pretty quickly, if you are one. <laughs> I am, oh, um, me too. But then. anyway, I, when I was at school in my day, um, I went to a, a grammar, public grammar school, and uh, in those days, of course, uh, any Jews or, or Catholic boys were not permitted to attend assembly because of the hymns and stuff and the, and the Protestant teaching, and we were not allowed to attend uh, the religious instruction classes or RE classes. Mm. So we used to, you know, the Jewish boys and me used to sit out in the corridor in the cloakroom passing an hour reading books and stuff while everybody else was taught the bible stories and we never actually learned the bible stories at all wow. we were never taught them so that's ironic that i would then end up in my later <laughs> life getting drawn into it through egyptology that's because bizarre, i didn't start off trying to prove the bible i actually started off investigating the history of ancient egypt the chronology of ancient egypt and it led me towards uncovering the true history of the bible I think I first came across your work, it was on the documentary, I think you were at Wadi Hamat, the, the quarry, was it the quarry? Oh yes, that's right, That's that was called Pharaohs and Kings back in 1995, that mm. was broadcast. I, that's, yeah, I mean that, that was sort of the beginning of it all for the public, that's the first they heard about it, but I've been working on it for 20 years before that. Mm. Wow, wow, so you've been at this for a while. <laughs> uh, a fair while, yeah, absolutely. Wow. The funny thing is that when I was a kid, I mean I don't, I can't explain this, but when I was a kid, um, mm. Well, I think I was about six years old at the time. Apparently, I, I wrote uh, every single Egyptian pharaoh's names from the first dynasty to the thirtieth dynasty, not only in hieroglyphs but also in Greek and English. So, <laughs> even before I could really write properly, I was writing down the names of the Egyptian pharaohs wow. in hieroglyphs. And wow. I went to Egypt for the first time at the age of nine, um, uh, at the, just after the Suez Crisis. This was so when nobody was going to Egypt at the time. There was no tourist industry. There was no mm. Nile boats sailing up and down, but uh, we managed to get on board King Farouk's royal paddle steamer. He had been kicked really? out of the country. Really? He'd been exiled to Italy. Wow. And so there's this ship, beautiful ship made of mahogany and brass with, you know, great paddle, round paddles going either side. And, and the crew were all in, in beautiful gala bays with gold bandanas and golden turbans. It was just an incredible thing. Wow. And, and there was me, nine years old, and my mum who took me. And I, apparently I insisted on going. Uh, and I ended up sleeping in King Farouk's bed in the royal apartments um, and sailing from Cairo all the way down to Abu Simbel because in those days, of course, there was no high dam. Uh, so we could go up through the locks of the British dam and sail all the way to Abu Simbel. There was no Lake Nasser. And I was given the, as a young boy of nine, uh, the, the boat arrived in the middle of the night and the next morning before dawn, I was given the great big brass key uh, shaped in the form of an ankh that opens the doors of the Temple of Abu Simbel, and I was sent down the gangplank onto the, the beach, because this was before the, the temple was moved, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. up above, and I was then sent off to open the great door of the temple and to let the sun shine in for, as it was rising across the other side of the, of the river, directly down into the Holy of Holies, and there was this little boy walking towards the Holy of Holies, holding this massive key, and approaching the statues of Ramesses II and the gods. As the sun lit my way, and this little shadow pointed all the way to the Holy of Holies. That was my introduction to Egypt. Wow, how beautiful is that? Wow. Yeah, it was amazing, I have to say. It was amazing. Wow. My, you, you've seen a lot of change then through Egypt, David. I have, yes. Unfortunately, I have. And it's rather sad because I get quite depressed going there these days. I bet um, you do. Not only because of the crowds, but the way that Egypt has changed. You know, I used to, I mean, I was, I was able to go and ride a donkey up to the Temple of Komombo up the beach through the palm trees and the, and the banana plantations to the mm. temple. Now it's a huge, great big conky key with about 30 boats and about 10,000 people pushing and shoving their way through the, the vendors to try and get to the temple. And it's just a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was, I would, you know, as a kid, I would go into the tomb of 
King Seti in the Valley of the Kings with a, an oil lamp because there's no electricity and actually go down into that tomb on my own without anybody there with a single lamp to, to guide my way. And oh. that is the atmosphere of ancient Egypt. Old not school. See today. That's old school there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just fabulous. It yeah. really was. I would be nostalgic about that too, I would. Um, what's new for it you? It was a while ago. It was a while ago. <laughs> well, you, you've seen pre-touristic uh, Egypt, and then you've seen touristic Egypt. Now you've seen the turmoil, troublesome Egypt today. So yeah. you've, you've yeah. seen three eras in a way, David. Mm, um, mm, that's I, true. And I've known the people involved, you know, from the earliest of the antiquities chairmen, uh, Ahmed Kadri, who was a wonderful man, right the way through to Zahi Awas and, and Mohammed Ibrahim. And as I said, I worked with Mohammed Ibrahim. I wrote articles with him, academic articles on the Serapium. So mm. I've experienced all the generations of people who have been in charge of the Egyptian antiquities throughout that, that period. And I have to say, and I have to be honest, that the only time that it was a total disaster was the time when Zaki Hawass was in charge. Yeah. The rest of the time, it was administered by scholars, professors, gentlemen, and honest men. Mm. And unfortunately, mm. in the time of Zaki, his tenure, tenure, uh, everything went to pot, I'm mm. afraid. So those people who think he's a hero and think he did a lot of good for Egypt, it's actually a complete and utter rubbish. Yeah, I had some vicious comments on my YouTube channel the other day, David, from a follower of Zahi, and I'm like, what planet is he on, this guy? <laughs> anyway. Well, they, they don't know and understand, that's the problem. They yeah. don't understand the inner workings of how it all works, and I've seen it from the inside. Mm -hmm. I know what happened, yeah. um, I, I know how things worked, I know how the position of Chairman of the Antiquities Service changed with Zahi, and, and what happened with his relationship with the, the former President Mubarak and his wife, Mm. and the Minister of Culture, and, and all those things that were going on there. He did a lot for himself, and you could argue that he did a lot for ancient Egypt because he brought, sorry, modern Egypt, because he brought a lot of tourists to Egypt, but it wasn't so much about him. The reason why tourists came to Egypt is because they love Egypt, and because it's a, a fantastic place to visit, and because the flights were available, cruise boats were being built. It wasn't so much Zahi's noise that was creating that. Uh, in, impulse. It was actually much more. For instance, when when Pharaohs and Kings came out in the UK yeah. in '95, yeah. I, the statistics were that the the number of tourists, incre British tourists, increased in Egypt by 25 percent following that TV series. Wow! So it, it it's not just about Zahi and what he's done. It's about lots of things. It's about the availability of programs on ancient Egypt. Uh, you know, on television, it's about, you know, uh, multi-channel viewing now that you can do so much there. Mm -hmm. And Zahi is just a part of that mechanism, but he is not the creator of the boom in tourism. Uh, but what we have now, of course, is a complete and utter collapse in tourism in Egypt. And it's going to be very, very difficult to kickstart that tourism again because the infrastructure has collapsed. The antiquity service has no more money now because most of their money came from tourism mm. to do their work. And so it's an extremely difficult position that Mohammed Ibrahim and his, and his colleagues find themselves in. Yeah. And Zahi Awas is exploiting that situation to try and undermine the, their uh, work to try and get the thing rolling again. Because he wants to show everybody that it was all about him, that he was the one that made it big and he was the one that uh, can now point out to the failings in the system, but the failings in the system are all about what he did for 10 years and not what's being done now. Yeah. You know, people have no idea the politics that goes within the tourism industry there, like you're talking about the tourism and the Egyptology. Yeah. There's, there's so much politics wrapped up in that. I mean, its own set of politics in a way. Um, there is, because there are so many different types of tourists in Egypt. Yeah. You have the, you know, you have the people who love Egypt and, I've studied and read books about it who go back time and time again mm -hmm. and they want to go and see more and more sites that are closed or not available or they're not on the normal tourist route. Then you have the tourists who come once, who, who want to do it once in their lives and they, yeah. they pile in in their thousands and they come by cruise ships to Alexandria or they fly into Sharm El Sheikh and they do the coach journeys uh, through the desert to Luxor or to, to the pyramids at Giza. And they're, they're, they're sort of like the ones that only come once and, and that they're not catered for really. They're just given a very superficial view of it all. Mm. Then you have the es esoteric new age people who come in and they want to do something very different to what everybody else wants to do. And they're prepared to pay lots of money in bribes to, to get a pyramid access that nobody else can have or to have, you know, meditations mm -hmm. in the, in the great pyramid uh, king's chamber when the, when the whole place is shut down and nobody else can go in there at night or whatever. So they, they, they have a different agenda. Mm. Mm. And they, they tend to create a sort of corruption network 
because they're paying for things that are not normally accessible mm. and they pay at a low level. So they're paying the local inspectors and guards, etc., to do mm. stuff, uh, which, which creates difficulties, I have to say. So, sure. and then of course you've got tour operators and people who want to make money out of the whole business. Mm. So there are so many different levels of this. Mm. And, uh, mm. and again, TV crews, TV crews have to pay an enormous amount of money to the antiquities service to get permission to film. So and and that was all controlled by Zahi in for the last decade. So there was abnormal was, fees, wasn't there? Abnormal fees involved. Abnormal, abnormal, yes. And and where the money went, we don't know. Um, and the other thing, of course, was you had to have Zahi in your film. If you didn't have Zahi in your documentary, you didn't get permission to 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 make a, to make your documentary. Wow. So he controlled everything literally. Yeah. You know, I've been what, three three times to Egypt, David, and every time I go, I, I just I'm due to come back again in March, and uh, it has been a couple of years since I was there. But every time I go, David, I just I'm mesmerised by the place. It has that effect on people. Well, for me anyway, it, I, it does. It does, and it did that for me in the early years, definitely, especially when I was a kid. But again, yeah. even I would say 15 years ago, I was still mesmerised by the place. But now I've sort of become disenchanted a little bit with it. Yeah. Because I've seen how it's deteriorated. Well, I, so see, I well, haven't, David. So I'm going to go back at a time when it's a little awkward and I'm a little dubious of what I'm going to see. And so it's well, been. What I wanted to say to you then, and and to your audience, is if you are going to thinking about going back to Egypt, and I do encourage you to do that, so that the Egyptian economy and the people can begin to pick themselves up off their feet uh, and get themselves back on the road, so to speak. Then I, I would say to you, don't necessarily just go on the bog standard trip. Try to find a way to go with somebody who knows what they're talking about so that you actually learn something much deeper and much richer than you would get from the usual stuff that you see on the regular tours. It, it is such so much more enriching when you go with somebody who can show you and tell you about stuff which you just no, do not get from the normal guides. Mm. And, and there are people like me and others like me who have very, very good Egyptian colleagues who go as guides with us who are gracious enough to allow us to speak at the monuments and we have this good rapport between guide and specialist and we can tell you so much more about the history of Egypt and so much more about the culture and the religion and the philosophy and all those things. So I do recommend you go with people like myself and Robert Boval and others who mm. know what they're talking about and actually can tell you so much more about what you're seeing than you would get on a normal tour. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously there was a scandal uh, that Robert got suckered into by Zahi, but setting that aside, I mean, the scandal was about these two archaeologists, or so-called ar so 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 called ar so called archaeologists, I should say, yeah. quote archaeologists, that's what they've been branded. I don't even know if they were, I, I don't know who they are, they were German, that's all I know. Yes, what were they were German students, I think. Students? Okay. Yes, okay, but uh, they seem to be mature students, not young students. What were they doing? Uh, they they, what, what they took they it do? upon themselves to, and, and not unreasonably, let's, let's make this very clear, that the, the, the process they were going through was actually a very interesting scholarly piece of work. The problem was they don't appear to have got the permission of the Antiquities Service. Now, they do seem to have had a permit <clears throat> to go into the Great Pyramid, uh, and and do some investigative work. And that is a normal thing you get. You pay, I don't know, $3,000 or whatever it is to get a ticket to do that. And what doesn't appear to have happened is they don't appear to have had permission to remove a sample of paint from the relieving chambers above the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid in order to find the date for the pigment. Wow. Now, as you probably know, there is a, there's a cartouche of King Khufu yes. in the relieving chambers, which goes behind another block. So That's... it had to have been, it had to have been painted this cartouche in red ink before the blocks were assembled. Otherwise it could not, nobody could have painted behind the block. Mm. So they, they didn't in fact take a sample from the cartouche. They took a sample of red paint from one of the quarry marks in the chamber, which wasn't actually the cartouche, which are the same ink, the same paint which is reasonable enough to do. And they took that back to to Germany with them to have it uh, dated, because you can date the samples, the paint samples, to find out and to uh, and to discover the true date of the pyramid. Now, as you know, Egyptologists, including myself, and I have to say, including Robert Boval, people don't realise this, all agree that the Great Pyramid was constructed in the Fourth Dynasty, okay. in the time of King Khufu. Sure. There are other people that take Robert's work on the alignments of Orion, etc., and the mm. Sphinx, yeah. and argue that the, the pyramid was built around uh, the 10th uh, millennium before 
uh, you know, the, the the Khufu period. So mm. 10,000 BC or whatever, 9,500. Now, these people argue that the pyramid was built then. And they want to, to say and argue that this cartouche of Khufu is a fake, that it was added in the 19th century, modern era, added in there to pretend or to prove that the pyramid was built by Khufu. I would contend it's a quarry mark. It's a sign of one of the gangs who who cut the block and dragged it to the pyramid and painted the Khufu cartouche on there. Mm -hmm. So it would be a very interesting thing to actually date the, the paint, the red paint, because that would tell us once and for all whether the pyramid is built in the 4th dynasty or built 10,000 BC. Or it, was, it would spe put the speculation to rest as well, David. It would, but the problem is they didn't go about it the right oh, way, no. by the yeah. sound of it. Did and unfortunately, there are rules you have to follow, mm. with, uh, understandably, because any Tom, Dick and Harry could do this sort of yeah. thing otherwise. Well, and what's happened now is, of course, Zahi has stirred this whole thing up and tried to blame not only Robert Beauval mm. by accusing her of being the master mastermind behind it, which is complete and utter nonsense. Uh, Robert Beauval has not been in touch with these people before. He's only just recently communicated with them to find out what's going on. He had nothing to do with this whatsoever. He's not a a Jew, a Belgian Jew or an Egyptian Jew living in, in Belgium, which mm -hmm. is what Zahi claims. He's nothing like that. He's a Christian, mm. a Catholic Christian, laps like me, but he's... His pedigree is a Christian family, a Catholic family. I can vote for so the Sahi lies and lies and lies about all this. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then you've got a, a situation where he's stirring it all because he wants to undermine the work of Muhammad Ibrahim as the new minister of antiquities. He mm. wants to have him overthrown. So he's blaming him. It's on his watch that this took place. And he's all doing this to try and maneuver himself back into power. Yeah. It's That's a, what he's doing. It's, he has a self interest in this for sure. Absolutely. So the, the right thing to do now, I think, for Mohammed Ibrahim is to have this test done properly by the right people, uh, to have Ganton Brink come back and use his robot in the shafts and get through the doors, because so, he was the originator of the concept, he was the man that, right. that designed yeah. the, the robot, to bring it, make it all respectable, to make it all done properly with the right supervision, get the doors open, find out what's behind them, get the paint analysed, find out what date the paint is, and let's get some answers. Mm. And that's what Robert and myself are trying to do. And I think hopefully we can persuade Mohammed Ibrahim to take these initiatives because that's the only way to sort this mess out. Mm. Where, where let's, is the... have, let's have no more briberies. Let's have no more backhanders. Let's have no more surreptitious try to find out this, that, and the other. Let's do it all through mm. the right authorities with an open mind and see what comes out. Sure. Where, where is the paint at now? Can this paint still, have they not <coughs> done anything with the paint? Whatever. <coughs> I think it's been, I think it's been analyzed in Dresden as far as I know. Um, um, do we have uh, any results? I, the results have not been published as far as I know either. And the problem is that I think the, under the permits conditions, that the publication of the results has to be through the Egyptian Antiquity Service. So there, because there's now a standoff, because uh, we've got, uh, you know, the police involved, we've got Interpol involved, we've got uh, a warrant for the arrest of these two Germans in Egypt, all this going on. It's unlikely now that there's going to be cooperation between the two parties. So it may take somebody like a Robert Boval to try and get this thing resolved. I mean, he's in touch with both sides. And maybe he can act as an intermediary to get the results published. Mm. But to be quite frank, in order to, because of all the, the dubious qualities of now, of nature of this particular investigation, it would be much better now for the the whole thing to be started again and for a new sample to be taken under the proper regime yeah. and done and done by several laboratories so they can cross check and compare mm -hmm. rather than a single laboratory on a on a dubious sample. We don't have the we don't know the origins of that sample now. It could be a fake sample that's gone to them. We just don't know. Mm whether the piece that went to the the laboratory is the same piece that came out of the pyramid. The bit that we gets, don't know that. Yeah, David, the bit that gets me is the, the reliefing chambers, for the people that don't know, the listeners, the, the reliefing chambers are above the king's chamber and they have yes. to be accessed via a ladder. Yeah. Was the ladder in there or did they get the, the ladder? The ladder is always stored there in the Grand Gallery because it's difficult to get it up to the Grand Gallery otherwise. So it's usually laid on its side somewhere in the Grand Gallery so that it can be just simply raised up and put up, up against the wall to get access to the hole at the top of the ceiling. Right. So that's where it was. Uh, but that it, access to that um, series of uh, relieving chambers must have been through uh, the, uh, what's the word, the agreement of the local inspectorate who was there and supervising. So the question that need, needs to be answered now was, were the inspectors privy to what was going on? 
in the relieving chambers, or did they literally walk out of the pyramid and leave them to their own devices? And that's what we don't know at the moment. But we know wow. what we do know is the inspectors have been arrested and actually in prison now wow. as a result of this. So we need to get clarification on all this, and that will be clarified best by what the Germans themselves say now in public and what they produce in by way of permit, so we can see what the wording of the permit was and who signed the permit and under whose regime it was. Because as far as I understand it, and I may be wrong about this, but the permit was issued in April when I believe Mohammed Ibrahim had been relieved as Minister of, of Antiquities and he was then later reinstated. So it may have actually been issued in the time when there was no Minister of Antiquities. Wow. So we don't know exactly the whole chronology of this and it needs to be sorted out. This is like sensational in, in, for all the wrong reasons. Like, Well, it's interesting and whether we'll get to the bottom of it, I don't know. But you know what Robert's like. He'll get to the bottom of it given mm. half a chance. Yeah, given half and, a chance. Uh, and, uh... and let's all encourage him to do so. But the first thing that has to happen is that the Germans have to make it very clear to the Egyptian authorities that Robert Oval was not involved in this process whatsoever mm -hmm. and that he's now only trying to sort it out because Zahi Awas has accused him of being the mastermind behind it. Sure. And that's a completely false accusation. Sure. Yeah, I did a show with Robert and, you know, to, to put this on the record as well. And uh, right, right. I feel sorry for Robert in a way because he always gets, <laughs> poor Robert gets the brunt of it all the Don't time. Don't feel sorry for Robert. Robert he, can look after himself. He's he's a, he, that's what he said at I, the end of the show. He's a tough cookie. I, yeah, I've just spent a week with him in Italy going around doing uh, lectures, uh, various conferences, and Robert is a very strong personality. Yeah. In fact, I couldn't get a word in edgeways most of the time when we were there. <laughs> he's, very but, passionate. Uh, he's a very passionate man. Actually, he did say at the end of the show, don't worry, I'm a tough cookie. I said, inhale. He, he is. He is. He's a man of the world, and he can sort himself out, and there's no problem there. And if anybody can get to the bottom of this, he can. Mm. And I will support him as best as I can in the process. Mm. He needs the support of not just of his fans, and he's got many millions of those, but he needs to support of academia too mm. because you know he's not he's never ever done anything unscrupulous his theory about the orion correlation with the pyramid shafts is a brilliant theory mm. and it was uh, accepted by ies edwards who was the leading pyramid specialist of his day mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing strange and weird about it and why people got so hot under the collar about it i just do not understand yeah you know if you look and understand the pyramid text and the way that the egyptians understood the theology of the stars and the planets and all those things yeah you can understand exactly why they did what they did with the shafts uh, all that as far as i'm concerned is perfectly legitimate uh, scholarly work and I think that academics need to open their eyes a bit and, and not be so scared of new ideas. Sure, yeah. And that's the thing. The pyramid texts back this all up, uh, David. They, 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 the context fits what Robert's trying to say about the, the Orion theory, the Orion correlation. I, I agree with you. The only, the only real contention as far as I'm concerned is this issue of the dating of the, ne the necropolis, the, the, the pyramids themselves, the sphinx, all the buildings around there, the temples, that is an area which has not been resolved. Mm. There are issues and there are questions to be asked about the date of the necropolis. And and there is certainly evidence that I've seen uh, at Giza for constructions and carvings that predate the Fourth Dynasty. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, not just the Sphinx, but there are rock-cut tombs in the area which are predate the, the the Fourth Dynasty as well. You can see that because the, the blocks of the Fourth Dynasty constructions are completely different to the earlier materials. Mm -hmm. The question that arises, though, is how much earlier? That mm -hmm. is the big question. Sure. Now, Robert's alignments argument uh, puts the date at 9 to 10,000 BC based on the the configuration of the three pyramids in relationship to the, to the Orion's belt in terms of their orientation, not the alignment of the shafts. That's a mm -hmm. fourth dynasty phenomenon. Yeah. But the actual orientation of the pyramids in relationship to the orientation of the three stars that puts the whole construction oh, sorry the whole concept in 10,000 BC but it doesn't put the construction in 10,000 BC exactly because there may well have been a religious cult center related to the solstices and the equinoxes on the Giza plateau way before the fourth mm -hmm. dynasty mm -hmm. that is a possibility mm -hmm. and that the pyramids were then constructed on that necropolis to somehow mirror or reflect what was there before them in memorandum in a way yeah, exactly. So there may well have been observation points, temple cult centers, etc., in the locations of the pyramids. For instance, the the causeway leading up to Khafre's pyramid. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you realize this, but either side of that causeway are quarries for the blocks which built the Great Pyramid mm -hmm. in the time of Khufu. Yeah. 
why, therefore, was the, was the causeway left intact and not cut away by the quarry workers, right? Because the, there was no concept at that point for the building of the Khafre pyramid, which would have come after Khufu's pyramid. Mm. So the causeway must have been a religious processional way mm. prior to the building of the Great Pyramid under Khufu. Sure. Sure. Okay, so there that... must have been an observation point where Khafre's pyramid is now located mm. for the one of the, uh, the solstices or equinoxes at, at um, sunset rather than sunrise, whereas the Sphinx is gazing to the east mm -hmm. for sunrise. Wow. So there is a lot that could potentially be understood about the necropolis, which is not related directly to the pyramids themselves. Another point worth noting, actually, David, is that the Great Pyramid is aligned to true north so accurately. I think it's like three sixtieths of a degree, whereas Greenwich, right. Me Greenwich Mean Time is aligned to nine sixtieths of a degree. <laughs> yes. It's three times more accurate than Greenwich Mean Time. But, <sighs> the, but the point is, the the Earth has a tilt in its axis, and it mm. can't be ten thousand because this this alignment of true north would be out. It would be a yeah. misaligned. Well, well this, this, yeah. go, go, <coughs> go, 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 sorry, just going back, like, if, if people even put like 20,000 BC and the extreme dates on the pyramid. This northerly uh, alignment that's inherent in the Great Pyramid would not be in existence. Certainly not past 20,000 yeah. BC. And 10,000 BC, you wouldn't see that accuracy. You know, I mean, look at Newgrange, right. and, Newgrange yeah. in Ireland today, mm. after five, <laughs> yeah. after 5,000 years, you can watch the alignments off by about a few inches, like, you know, so. Yeah. But, but, I, well, I think this all gets down to this whole business of, and I hate to to, to raise this subject because it's it's something which gets in my craw. But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this whole idea of advanced cultures, pre-existing advanced cultures, or even alien cultures, mm. somehow or other doing all this work <clears throat> and aligning aligning things in some magical way, I am so dead against this. Um, I'm not. First of all, I'm not against the idea that we are the only um, civilizations or creatures in the universe by any stretch of the imagination. Sure. Nobody who's got a brain will think that we are the only, you know, God's creators on, on, uh, in the universe. Sure. The number of, um, you know, habitable planets in the universe is in the trillions. Yeah. You know, so it's a nonsense to think that we're the only life forms. So there are other civilizations, probably more advanced than us, some, some not, some more, across the universe. And there's not to say that in some time in our past, one of those civilizations may have visited this planet, although I don't think it's the case. What I do not understand is why people have to go down the Stargate sort of fantasy route of saying that, you know, there is either an Atlantean civilization or a alien civilization who, who taught these dumb Egyptians to build these wonderful monuments. You know, these silly Egyptians who could not do anything for themselves, who, who are not capable of, with technology, to work the stones and do these wonderful uh, pieces of artwork. Mm. Why do we have to decry and, and belittle human civilization in that way? You just have to look at what we've achieved over the, the millennia as, as a civilization, the music we write, the art we create, the statues we, 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 we carve, the wonderful buildings we make, to, 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 to suggest that we cannot are not capable of doing this mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. is just to make to, to make us into a nonsense. Mm -hmm. We're not apes, you know. We're not we're not apes with a, an advanced civilization telling us how to do these things. What we don't realize is that in ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia in these places, they didn't have the com complicated lives that we have today. They were civilizations who thought different to us. Mm -hmm. They they developed skills beyond what we can do today because we, they didn't have the clutter of modern technology <laughs> exactly. in their lives. You we're, know? we're handicapped in a way, and these guys weren't. They, we're, we're handicapped exactly. with our Western civilization. Like, you know, it's we're caught they, up in they, our... knew, they knew how to cut stone. They knew how to move stone, stone. They knew how to build buildings. That's what they did. That's what they were experts in. Mm. Okay, we don't understand now today how they did it. Yeah. We don't know how they really cut those granite obelisks. Mm. We don't know how they drill those fantastic holes and those wonderful reliefs and all the rest of it. We don't know how they built these huge pyramids. Mm -hmm. We don't understand it. But that's not because it's a foreign alien civilization that built them. Sure. It's because we've lost the will or the knowledge of how they did it. Yeah. Just lost, like we've lost our sense of smell that animals have, or we've lost our eyesight the way that the ancients had. 
you know, that, that our skills are different now to what they were in those days. And that's what it boils down to. I always draw people to the attention, David, and I'm with you on that, is that these guys had a lovely template for a civilization. It was like, you know, they had a great philosophy. They were, you know, a great science. They explored nature. They explored science. They explored astronomy. They yeah. explored, you know, all sorts of philosophies. Like, you know, they were teachers. They were, they were teaching their own philosophy. And, and it was all knowledge-based. That's absolutely right, and people people admire that tremendously. But you mustn't forget also that the ancient world was an incredibly bloody and dangerous place to exist in. Mm. You know, I mean, the, the the amount of killing and and slaughter that went on in those days. Barbaric. If yeah. you, I mean, you you just take an example of Joshua and the Israelites going and conquering the promised land. If that really did happen. That was the first ethnic cleansing in history. Yeah. They slaughtered every living being, creature, baby, infant, woman, man that got in their way to get that landscape, to, to actually control that area. Wow. They were brutal. Wow. They were absolutely brutal people. And the Assyrians were no better. They used to impale people on stakes and flay them alive. And the Egyptians, I'm sure, had their own uh, atrocities to mm -hmm. account for, although mm -hmm. we don't know many of them, to be honest. Mm. So, yes, I mean, you know, when 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 you see a relief of a pharaoh on, on a temple um, caving in the heads of his enemies with a mace, that sure. isn't fiction. They did that. Yeah. They did that in ritual performances in front of the people to show their virility and power and mm. strength. You know, these were not hippie times by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination. I think a lot know? of so, people... A lot of people would like to believe that, yeah, that they were hippie times. Yeah, and... well, let's let's get real about it. As mm. I said to you before, we now know the Minoans were cannibals. Yeah. So let's let's not get you know let's not get too flower flower power about it. Sure. But I want to I want to just point out something very special that came out of the research of uh, the archaeologists who were excavating that city of Avaris we talked about earlier, oh, where yeah. the the true Israelite sojourn took place between the time of Joseph and Moses mm. before they left for the Promised Land. Um, and it's not often in archaeology that you can find something specific that you can say belongs to the Bible. But I want to tell you something that really astonished me when it came to light, and I was involved in what happened at the time. But the, what the archaeologists did, well, they, they dug through the city to the earliest levels, and, and there they found something amazing. They found a Syrian-style house that was built on this site, that came from the region of, of Haran in that area, North Syria, where Abram and the tribes came from originally in that area, around Urfa and, and Haran. Mm -hmm. And this house was built in exactly the same style as what you find in that area of Haran. And yet it was in Egypt, in the land of Goshen, on a virgin site in a field where nothing had been built before. And this house was surrounded by a dozen or so houses of smaller kind, okay, which amounted to about 70 to 100 people in told, in all told. Now that is the number of people that Jacob brought into Egypt when Joseph became vizier of the country after the famine or during the famine. Mm -hmm. Around 70 to 100 people were brought in. And that was the core of the city, which became this massive, one of the biggest cities in the ancient world. By the time of the Exodus, this was a huge city spanning several square kilometers. So the population had expanded massively from that small core at the beginning, surrounded that little Mittelsal house, the Germans call it. It's a, uh, a middle room house from Syria. Wow. Now, on top of that house, which was demolished in the next generation, was built a palace, a beautiful palace in Egyptian style. And the facade of the palace had 12 columns in front of it. And as you know, Jacob had 12 sons. Mm -hmm. And in that palace, there was a, a Nordic chamber and a robing room and a large bedroom. And it's a beautiful thing. And in the back garden of the palace, the archaeologists found 12 tombs. Okay. Again, 12 pillars, 12 tombs, 12 sons of Jacob. Okay. One of the tombs was a pyramid tomb. It was the only one that was a pyramid tomb with a chapel on really? the front. Now, it's amazing to find a pyramid tomb at this time. Because pyramid tombs were only ever constructed in this era for kings and queens, not for commoners, not for ordinary people, officials, right? And yet this tomb belonged to an official of state who was not king of Egypt, and yet it was a pyramid tomb. And when they uh, uh, excavated into the tomb, they found in the chapel the smashed remains of a colossal seated statue of the king, of the person who was buried in the pyramid tomb. Okay. 
And when they examined it, they wow. found that he, he had red hair, he had yellow skin, wow. and he had a throw stick across his shoulder as a scepter of office. Now, a throw stick in the ancient world was a symbol of a Semitic person. It's like a hunting device, like mm. a boomerang. Yeah, yeah. And whenever you see this throw stick, it means this guy is not Egyptian. He's a Semite, a Semite. In other words, he was a Semitic high official working for the Egyptian state, mm -hmm. and the state, the king, had given him a palace in the land of Goshen with a pyramid tomb and a colossal funerary statue. Okay? And when you look at the back of the statue, the fragments that are left, the paint that survives shows that he was wearing a coat of many colours. Wow. Okay? And in the tomb, when they dug the tomb beneath the pyramid, they found that the tomb burial chamber was completely empty. There was no coffin, there was no pottery, there were no mummy beads, and most of all, most importantly, there was no body, no bones. Now, when robbers um, wreck or jo uh, go into a tomb and plunder it, they do not take the bones with them. Mm -hmm. The bones are of no value to them whatsoever. Sure, sure. And if you know the story of Joseph, when he died, he asked his brethren to make sure that if they ever left Egypt and went to the Promised Land, they the would take his body from the tomb yep. and, and bury it in Shechem in the Promised Land. And that's exactly what we see in Avaris. We found the palace of Joseph. We have the tombs of his brothers, and 12 tombs, we have the pyramid tomb of Joseph with the cult statue of Joseph wearing his multicolored coat and we find an empty tomb. Wow. So there is proof to me that archaeology and the Bible coincide oh. and one confirms the other. Wow. That's so fascinating, David. So fascinating. I can't wait to read Lords of Avaris now. David, we'll, 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 we'll have another show for that. We'll have I'm to, sure. David. We'll have to. Look, we're at the top of the second hour. It's been so great talking with you today. It really has. Um, what a knowledgeable guy you are. What a knowledgeable guy. Well, one uh, day you'll have to get me and Robert on together. That'll be good fun. Yeah, you know, actually, that would be a good show, and uh, we'll do that. I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna do that in the new year. I'll, I'll have read okay. the Lords of Avaris by then, and we'll get you and good. Robert back for a double show. That'd be super well, interesting for the show. Only on one condition, that is that he doesn't actually hog the whole show, and I get to talk a bit. <laughs> You'll okay. have to fight with him for that one. He's a he's right, he's a prolific talker. David, I just want to say your webpage before we go is davidrollontour.blogspot.co.uk. And you can That's catch right. your books there. I'm going to stick it in the YouTube description as well and for the guests on the right. webpage. Um, uh, just before you go, are you working on anything uh, interesting at the moment? Are you writing? I'm just, uh, yes, I'm just writing a book on the Exodus myth or history question mark, which oh. will deal with all this material because I've been involved in the making of a movie documentary in America about this whole issue of Exodus. Wow. <clears throat> as you know, that there's two movies coming out uh, in the next uh, 18 months and two years on Moses. Uh, one done by, mm -hmm. was going to be done by Spiel, Spielberg, Spielberg, but now it's going yeah. to be done by Ang Lee. And the other one done, uh, done by, uh, our famous, uh, English director, uh, whose name is completely gone from my head, who did, uh, Gladiator. Uh, let, help me with this one. Um, um, Madonna's boyfriend, ex-boyfriend. Guy Ritchie. Yeah. No, uh, well, no, 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 the director. Um, yeah, Guy Ritchie. Oh, Rid Ridley Scott. Oh, Ridley Scott. Scott. Oh, sorry, I got it. He's yeah. just making a mo movie at the moment in Spain on Moses. He's filming really? here. Wow. And that will be coming out in about a year's time. So all the excitement about the Bible is going to be resurrected in the near future. <laughs> wow. it, uh, Bible stories have become the new vampire movies. Yeah. So uh, so there's going to be a whole new genre of biblical epics coming out. You know, there's the one on Noah's Flood that's being released shortly and mm -hmm. stuff. So mm -hmm. it's going to be the new genre of, of epic movies. So... This movie, documentary movie I've been involved with deals with this whole thesis that I've been t telling you about, the revised chronology, yeah. how to look for the biblical stories in a new timeline. And so I've written a book to accompany that, and that will be out sometime in the new year. Wow. Well, I look forward to that, David. David, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. You know, you I've enjoyed it. Oh, me too. And you come back anytime, David. That's fantastic. Nice to meet you. You too. Take, Take care, care now.